this episode, we pay a visit to the Highlands, where we'll speak with Malcolm Downey, the man behind the sublime beer of fine ales. For almost two decades, this Scottish farmhouse brewery has made a name for itself by keeping one foot planted firmly in tradition and the other in progress. It doesn't hurt that each summer they throw a party in the Glen that's not to be missed. Don't touch that dial. Welcome to No Pants During the Pandemic. Hi, I'm Kevin Brooks, and this is No Pants During the Pandemic. Today, I'm joined by a man who spent all day working at his brewery, followed by an excursion searching for packing boxes, and then the not-so-short trip home. Only to then humor his buddy and submit to an online interview. Please join me in welcoming Malcolm Downey from Fine Ales in Scotland. Hey, Malcolm. How's it going? Ah, oh, not bad, Kevin. How's, how's things across the pond? We're doing okay. Just trying to keep busy. Let's jump right into things. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? About me? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> that threw me. I was expecting beer questions. <laughs> we'll get to the beer questions, but I'm starting with you. My name is Malcolm. I'm the head brewery at, head brewer at Fine Ales in Argyll in Scotland. Um, I've been just just about a few weeks shy of 15 years there. How'd you first get into beer? How I got into beer? Uh, I guess it was my mum's brother. Yeah, now that my parents were both wine or whiskey. They weren't. They weren't beer drinkers. But my my mum's brother was. He was in the the Royal Navy for twenty twenty some years, and I can vividly remember getting met off the train in Edinburgh by him one afternoon. I must have been about fifteen or so. Taken into pub, sit there, drink that, shut up. <laughs> and that, that that was slightly underaged, but yeah, I can vividly remember that pint of um, Einkoop Burton Ale in a bar that's changed hands and changed names many times since. That's probably nearly 30 years ago, which is quite a scary thought. And from there, fencing was my main sport when I was younger. And through a friend from that who was studying brewing, my friend said, try brewing. Look at that. So I did. I'd applied to do chemistry in Edinburgh, chemistry at Harriet Watt. Perry Watts had a better fencing team than Edinburgh University, so I went there, studied brewing, graduated in 98. Where was your first job? Straight after uni, I went down to Bulmers and Hereford, into the cider mill there, did a cider season there, which was pretty eye-opening. I think it won, when we were fully up and running, we were pressing about 1,200 tonnes of fruit a day. Didn't eat an apple for about five years. Um, back into that, that finished just, just before Christmas. Late December, early January, I started at Belhaven in Dunbar, just outside Edinburgh. I was there for about a year. Between Belhaven and Fine Ales, I was basically just working for one of my friends, doing little bits of everything from welding plastic to making biodiesel to you name it. There were many things going on, and none of them really seemed to make very much business sense, but it was a job, I suppose. So the job came up at Fine and been there ever since. How did Fine Ales get started? Finals uh, started in um, November November 2001. The current MD, Jamie, his, his parents set it up. Basically, they'd retired back to the area, to the, the sort of the family house. They were looking to bring some enterprise, bring some jobs and, uh, and employment back into the area. And they had a disused milk and parlor, and it seemed a good idea to put a brewery in it. And by the family house, it's this little thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's just a little wee cottage. <laughs> That wee cottage is a 4,500-acre farm located in the Scottish Highlands. What's it like up there? It's in a fairly rural setting. It's on a farm. There's about 80 or 90 Highland cattle, 250 head of uh, red deer. The sheep have mostly gone, but you've got animals now that don't try and kill themselves and pay the bills, so it's 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 pretty nice. It's in Glen Fine. There's the River Fine. There's Loch Fine. It's, it's all fine, really. 
why don't you tell them what it looks like as you come off the the main road and go up go up the glen road it kind of opens up in front of you you've got small hills on both sides ultimately if you keep on past the brewery you go past maybe another five or six houses and six miles later you end up at hydro dam uh, with a really nice view down the glen on a clear day which you know scotch mist and all that doesn't happen an awful lot but when it's a clear day it's it's pretty stunning but it's it's just rough ground mountains waterfalls it's nice Scotland in nature. <laughs> it's a different world. Great place to social distance. It's quite easy. There's nobody to get <laughs> to get near. <laughs> What's the brewery known for? Fine Hills are predominantly known for Jarl, which is 3.8% single hop, etc. It's a pale golden ale. We started off initially as a summer special. The name came about as our previous summer special was Summerled, who was the king of Argyll, who chased the Vikings out of Argyll. And a Jarl is a Viking Earl, so Jarl pushed Summerled out of the way. Initially, it started off as a summer special, cask only. Now we do it cask, keg, bottle. That's probably about 50-60% of what it produces is Jarl in one form or another. Wow, didn't realize it was that high. <laughs> I have seen in the big brew house five brews uh, an entire week of making Jarl, which is a bit boring, but it, you know, it smells nice, tastes nice, keeps the lights on. Finds hard to pin down. You brew a lot of classic real ale. But then you'll make some traditional beer with a craft twist, and then make something modern that's pushing the envelope. How do you guys balance all of that? It's kind of a weird one to bridge because we do seem to settle. We've got feet in both camps, the sort of traditional, because we still do such a large amount of cask beer. We've always got kind of that in the back of the mind. This is our bread and butter. Session beers, nothing too ultra, nothing too extravagantly out there. But we've had a raspberry ripple pale ale in cask which sold surprisingly well we've done new england ipas in cask which again people have taken to and bought quite happily it's 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 kind of a weird one i would love us to do a lot more big hoppy ipas and keg but it's a, it's a difficult one to get out because we've got to get our name people associating keg beer instead of traditional cask beer with us and it's it's getting there it's getting there slowly i mean we've got a workbench which was a project tweaking recipes to come up with a five and a half percent ipa as a sort of core product in cask we've got the the everyone loves series which is we, every month a different single hopped 3.8 percent session pale we just started doing mixed date which is our 5.2 percent cask ipa mixed it being a, a blend of hops it's the nod to the old school making mixtapes of what you heard on the radio and this week it's, it's that kind of make a blend of something that predominantly fruity not your sort of traditional west coast style but very soft fruity juicy kind of like uh new england without the, the without the sort of serious uh, haze and the the just keeping our, our, our normal yeast rather than a, a new england strain so it's kind of trying to bridge the traditional and modern you lasted on the original brewery for a while, but ultimately you got too big. What did you do? So the original brew house, uh, 16 hectolitre, 10 British barrel, it was in the, the milk and parlour of what was the original dairy uh, on the farm. So that started in 2001. Well, fast forward a few years, we were ended up doing sort of nine brews a week through that for a couple of years, which was... The kit was creaking, we were creaking. Uh, it was kind of it was a no-brainer that we needed a bigger kit, but getting something of the right size and the right scale and scope of what we're looking for, I guess the, the design process was probably about a couple of years. January 2014, we broke ground on the civil side of redeveloping an old, the old sheep shed into a brew house, also on the farm, literally about 200 yards from the, the original brewery. We were brewing on, I think it was the 23rd of October was the first brew that we, that we put through that. And that's 40 barrel, British built, mashed on, copper, hot back. A traditional British brew house, but very much more modern than, than the one we were using. Fairly high levels of automation, control. The, the, the ethos behind it was improve consistency, improve control, improve batch repeatability. Just basically make it like the old brewery, but bigger, better, more control. Since then, we've added two more 40 barrel tanks, two more 80 barrel tanks. We had been kind of looking at a little bit more expansion, but who knows what's going to come out at the end of this? Who knows? 
With the original brew house, you didn't sell it. It's still active at Fine. Only now it's brewing farmhouse ales. Yes, I mean, the, the sort of strap line is that we are a farmhouse brewery because we are on a farm. The old kit is now Origins Brewing, which is basically everything that I will not let into the big brewery. Wild yeast, bacteria, all the sort of things that when I was being taught, you don't want because it causes problems. We can let, run wild and rampant in, in, the, in the old brew house. Wood fermented, we've got a spontaneous blend that we just released a few months back which was three different seasons of spontaneous fermentation blended in fruit, herbs, bacteria, yeast. You come up with an idea, come up with a concept for a beer, brew it in the old kit, stick it in some wood, fruit it. It's what has taken, as you say, it's a farmhouse brewery, taking inspiration from the land, trying to put our guile in a glass. I like that. With most of the beer going into wood, how many barrels do you guys have now? increased not improved <laughs> they're all one here one was... there a couple down here yeah they're a bit all over the place i guess it's probably 60, yeah probably somewhere between 40 and 50 in various stages of fermentation maturation finishing uh, finishing as in spirit barrel adding a bit of uh, character to be or so, so a lot of the the spontaneous stuff it goes into wood straight away to ferment and by the nature of that product it could be in the wood for a year could be in for a couple of years until that's it that's right that's ready take it out stick it in some steel if we're going to put fruit in it if we're not if not we're just we're going to bottle it uh blend it with something else andrea was headed up the origins project until he left who's at the helm now yeah we've got pavel uh Pavel Novak, who came to us, he's, he's Polish originally, he came to us from Dos Corvos in Lisbon. About late summer, early autumn last year, we started interviewing for a, a head of origins position for someone who had the ability and the focus to just, right, this is where we are, this is where we're going to be in a year and a couple of years, scale it up. Basically, when we were interviewing, it's like, right, come meet us, bring some beer. It doesn't have to be your own beers, but a beer that you enjoy. Talk to us about the beer and... The beers he brought were very good. Uh, the Dosh God was the ones he'd, he'd made. The beers he brought were very good, and his reasoning for them was very good. And you could, you could see him when we were going around the, the, the old kit, so looking at things, and, oh, yeah, I could do this, I could do that. And I mean, that's not to say that uh, some of the other guys didn't, but he just seemed to click. He sort of took a look around the Glen, and you could see him thinking, yeah, this is home, really. So he's, he's fitted in pretty well. You have a tap room up in the Glen, too. What's it like? Around about eight years ago, we opened the tap room. The decision to, to open it was probably taken a bit earlier. So yeah, we don't we don't really run it as a pub. It is purely just as a as a brewery tap room and sample room. You know, you can come in, sample some of the beers. We've got some of the local butchers making pies, sausage rolls. There's quite often some soup. We've got some beers to take away. It's just a nice quiet space. You can come in, taste the beers, chat through. Oh, I like this, or oh, you might like this tours of the, of the brewery set off from there you quite often you could be sitting there and some guys who've been up in the climbing the hills come in still in their gear it's just a nice quiet relaxed space with hopefully some of the freshest fine fine ales you'll you'll get tell me about fine fest yeah for sure uh fine fest it's uh, our festival it's in the first second weekend of june every year it started off really just as a party. We got about a dozen casks of beer, set up a bar and a small tent in the yard at the brewery. Maybe a couple of hundred people came along. Last year, I think it was pushing two and a half thousand people in a slightly bigger tent down by the river. The ethos behind it is beer, food and music. It's good beer, good music, good food, good people. Bringing together like-minded folks. It's just a weekend long party, really. Sometimes the weather's nice, sometimes it's not. Unfortunately, you saw it when it really wasn't very good last summer. It was a little moist. As we were driving up to Cairndale, I kept looking at the rain coming down in buckets and just thought, this is not good. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I have to say, the weather that weekend was pretty biblical. I think we went through three changes of clothes on the Friday. Saturday got a bit better. It was. At least the rain ended early that day. Of course, then there was Sunday. I was awakened on Sunday morning by my phone telling me I had several missed calls, text messages. The gist of it being, the Brewer's Lounge is no longer. <laughs> it has blown away. I thought, somebody's trying to wind me up here. <laughs> that can't be. But yeah, the tent blew away. 
for which we do apologize. Not your fault. It was just weird. We went to bed after five in the morning and the tent was there, but it was gone when we came back a few hours later. Two of the three bars in the tent were totaled, but we made the most of it. We got the electricity back on, cleaned up our bar, and poured outside. Yeah. Al fresco. We had a blast. We want to go back next time. You're both more than welcome. I think you're definitely part of the extended family. <laughs> Whether you want Edible. to or not. <laughs> Every time Andy and I get together, we tell stories about the trip. Well, that you've kind of summed up Fine Fest right there. You see the same faces year after year after year, and they come back, they bring their friends, and they've each got their own stories. I mean, there's guys I played rugby with 15, 20 years ago. I think they've been to pretty much every one apart from the first one. There's loads of brewers that have been there pretty much constantly. And it's just, everybody's got a fine fest story. That's part of what we're doing. It's, it's just making good memories for people. The weather didn't seem to dampen anybody's spirits. It was a big party and those were some pretty late nights. I normally give up about three-ish. And I always try and get a picture looking back down the hill. Because everything, the lights are still on. The sun's kind of thinking about coming up. And as long as it's not absolutely hammering with rain, it's some some pretty spectacular photos. Just it is like some weird, I don't know, weird lights and something's going on, but you're not entirely sure what. It's yeah, uh, yeah. The wee small hours there... you see some sights. <laughs> the mud was the only pain. Yeah, it was. <laughs> small, uh, small note. That field is known as the water meadow pretty much for a very good reason. It's just about on the water table. It's such a nice setting. It's a big, flat setting. You've got the river on one side, the hills on the other, hills at the behind the campsite. It is a pretty nice setting. It's just a little bit wet. Most of our girls are a little bit wet, but that small part of it is really quite wet. You know, we try and put a bit more drainage in. Every year we try and sort of work the ground a little bit. And it's been getting better. It's just last year was, yeah... I haven't seen that much rain in all the time we've lived there. And there's people lived there a lot longer than me, and they were saying pretty much the same thing. It was pretty intense rain. Needless to say, there's problems for the festival this year. Yeah, sadly this year the the sort of the global the, the coronavirus COVID nineteen has forced the postponement of Fine Fest. We're looking at doing something later in the year. When that would be, who knows? Where are we? We're in the third week of lockdown just now. How long that's going to last? You're looking at Wuhan's just coming out of after nearly three months, so that's that's going to put us back end of June, probably before anything returning to normal. And then I'd love to say it'll definitely be going ahead this weekend, but it's it's very much in the lap of the gods at the minute. I'll be keeping my fingers crossed. Has the coronavirus been affecting the brewery? Yeah, well, pretty much. All, all the pubs being shut means most of our business is gone. We're really just dealing with supermarket sales and online sales. It's been kind of comforting. There's been an awful lot of mail orders, whereas normally we'd have maybe 10 or a dozen going out a day. We're talking probably averaging about 80 to 90 packages going out a day. It's just a general sort of feeling of people wanting to support you. And I say it's it's kind of touched us. It's really people out there care about us and are you know wanting us to keep going on and keep us keep us keep us going through this. So it's. It's really quite heartwarming, and it kind of restores my faith in humanity a little bit. That's nice. Um, how many people does the brewery employ, and what's going on with them right now? Yeah, we got probably 20, 22, 23 staff between office production, tap room, delivery, sales. Yeah, pretty much all furloughed. There's me and Elaine, who's the, our office manager, who we were deemed to be sort of essential personnel. So we've been in all the way through the lockdown. Got a couple of casual guys coming in, doing bits and pieces. We've got one run going out to some local supermarkets, as opposed to having some like maybe 14 runs a week. We're down to one one delivery run. Chris did a 65 acre workbench yesterday, which will be added on to some stock we had in tank, and that that's going to get canned. And basically, it's already been sold, which is which is nice. So yeah, it's it's pretty quiet in the brewery just now. Um, I do my best with the radio, but it doesn't it's not the same <laughs> missing 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 the, the good faces yeah i understand that the government has stepped up to help out yeah that's i think i guess that's um probably the big thing here we the, the government here has introduced the, the furloughed staff the there's a scheme but whereby the government will pay 80 percent of their wages up to two and a half thousand uh pounds per month 
I, I have no idea where the money's coming from, but it's it basically means you can say, right, mothball the business. We'll call you back when it's, when it's safe to come up and round. You know, there's no pressure being putting people to go out and work and uh, come into contact with situations they're not comfortable with. It's kind of like a welfare check, I suppose, of just, you know, we'll support you, we'll keep you going. In a couple of months' time, businesses will all be back up and running. We're pretty lucky with that because we're in quite a healthy, stable financial position. But there's a lot of other companies are not just in Bruin, but generally speaking, a lot of small businesses would be in a lot of trouble if the, if the government hadn't announced this um, the sort of affordable payments. So what's the mood like in general in Scotland right now? It's kind of weird because where we are is not really affected. That's not true. It is affected, but it's not. We're rural enough that it's not really an issue. You know, you go sort of 30 miles in that direction and you're in Glasgow and it would be... I haven't been, I haven't been in Glasgow for about three weeks. I'm just staying the hell out of Dodge. The mood in Scotland, I think, is... F- How many Scots do you know? We're all pretty bullish at times. <laughs> we might be quite quiet, but we're all a bit hard-nosed to the point of stupidity in some cases. I would say the mood's fairly upbeat, but cautious. It's It's just not knowing. There doesn't seem to be any sort of definitive testing going on. There doesn't seem to be any sort of, oh, but you've had it, so you're immune. Okay, where is the scientific proof to that statement? You know, there's there's, there's a lot of unknown, which is causing fear. But generally speaking, I'd say we're fairly stoic, I think is the word. All right, my stoic friend, I appreciate you taking the time to talk. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It's been good. It's always good to catch up and... Yeah, hope all we'll, hope all you guys stay safe, and we'll see you for a beer in in person, um, hopefully before too long. I hope so. Bye, Malk. If you'd like to learn more about Fine Owls, please visit their website. The link is in the video's description. And if you're in the UK, you can get their beers shipped to your door. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.